All this to bring us to God and to make everlasting life ours. This is the sure word of the gospel, which whosoever believeth is saved and shall never come into condemnation. There are few who do not know what the word substitute means when used concerning common things, but it is well that we should see how the right knowledge of this word is the key to the right understanding of the gospel. Christ for us, or Christ our substitute, is the gospel or glad tidings of great joy which apostles preached and which we can tell even in these latter days to the sons of men as their true hope. The good news which we bring is not of what we are commanded to do in order that God may be reconciled to us, but of what the Son of God has done instead of us. He took our place here on earth that we might obtain his place in heaven. As the perfect one in life and in death, as the doer and the sufferer, he is presented to us that we may get the complete benefit of that perfection so soon as we receive his gospel. All our imperfection, however great, is lost in the completeness of his perfection, so that God sees us not as we are, but as he is. All that we are, and have done, and have been, is lost sight of in what he is, and has done, and has been. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It is this sin-bearing completeness of the Son of God as the substitute that the sinner rests upon. It is on this that we take our stand in our dealings with God. We need a sin-bearer, and God has given us one who is altogether perfect and divine. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. We once dealt with a young man as to this. He sat with his Bible before him, pondering the way of life, and asking, What must I do to be saved? He was in darkness, and saw no light. He was a sinner. How was he to be saved? He was guilty. How was he to be forgiven? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. No, certainly. But how, then, was his question? By Christ doing the whole. But is this possible, he asked? Can I be saved by another's doing the whole for me? It is not only possible, but it is certain. This is the way, the only way. It is God's one way of saving the sinner. And have I nothing to do? he asked. Nothing in order to be saved, we replied. But tell me, how is this to be? Let us come back to the truth about the substitute. You know what that is. I do. But how does this bear upon my case? Christ offers himself to you as your substitute, to do what you should have done, to suffer what you should have suffered, to pay what you should have paid. Do you mean that Christ has actually paid my debt, and that this is what I am to believe in order to be saved? No, your debt is not paid till you believe. Then it is paid, paid once for all, once and forever, but not till then. How then is the work of Christ as a substitute good news to me? There is enough of money lodged in the bank to pay all your debts twice over, and you have only to apply for it. Hand in your check and you will get the money at once. I see, I see, he said. It is believing that brings me into actual possession of all the fruits of the sin-bearing work upon the cross. Yes, just so. Or let me put it another way. Christ died for our sins. He is the substitute. He is presented to you as such. Are you willing to take him as such, that he may pay all your debts and forgive all your sins? Yes, but let me see this more fully, for it seems too simple. Well, put it thus. God has provided a substitute for the guilty, who 1,800 years ago suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. The Father presents that complete substitute to you and asks your consent to the exchange. The Son presents himself to you, offering to be your substitute. The Holy Spirit presents him to you as a substitute. Do you consent? The Father is willing. The Son is willing. The Spirit is willing. Are you willing? Do you give your consent? Is that it? said he. It is. Your consent to take Christ as your substitute is faith. Is that it? said he again. And the light broke upon him. Christ our substitute was the dawning of the day. Thus it is that the sinner's chain is broken and he is set free to serve God. First liberty, then service. The service of men set free from condemnation and from bondage. It is in accepting the divine substitute that the sinner is set free to serve the living God. The liberty flowing from forgiveness thus received is the true beginning of a holy life. If, then, I am to live a holy life, I must begin with the substitute. I must deal with him for pardon and deliverance. Thus, being by him delivered out of the hands of our enemies, we serve God without fear, in holiness and righteousness, all the days of our life. 
If I am to serve God, and if I am to possess anything of true religion, I must begin with a substitute. For religion begins with pardon, and without pardon religion is a poor and irksome profession. There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. This is the divine watchword. Not first the fear of God, and then forgiveness, but first forgiveness, and then the fear of God. The Long Time by Horatius Bonar the fourth chapter in the booklet, How Shall I Go to God? It is the Lord Jesus himself who has given us these words in one of his parables. He says, After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh, and reckoneth with them. Matthew 25:19. Thus, while in one place he speaks of the little while, in another he speaks of the long time. Little, yet great. Short, yet long. Both are true. And it is this double expression that makes up the full character of man's condition here as preparing for the great day of the Lord. From the day when the Master left the earth and went up to the Father to the day when he shall come again in his glory to sit on the awful throne before which all nations shall be gathered is in one sense a long time, as men reckon years and ages. But in another sense it is but a little while if we reckon time as God reckons it and compare it with the vast eternity in which it is to be swallowed up. Life is a vapor, and that is little. Life is a journey, and that is long. Life is a handbreadth, and that is little. Life is a period made of many days and weeks and months and years, and that is long. Life is a post, and that is swift. Life is a pilgrimage, and that is slow. Life is like the eagle hastening to his prey. Life is a time of sojourning. Life is like a weaver's shuttle. Life is fourscore years, and once it was well nigh a thousand. For some purposes a day is a short time, while for others it is a long time. In some circumstances a year is a short time, while in others it is a very long time. Much depends upon what is to be done in that period, and our ideas of long and short in such cases are influenced by the amount of work to be done. It seemed an age, said a traveler among the Alps, who lay bruised by a fall into a deep cleft of ice, ere my guides returned from the village, bringing the ropes to pull me up. Yet it was only two hours. But he had measured the time, not by moments or minutes, but by his sufferings and his danger. Of an old German peasant, the following story is told by a lady who visited him. He had a little garden in which were a few apple trees, which were covered with fruit. He amused himself daily with walking through his garden and picking up the apples which were dropped. The lady met him one day when he was thus engaged. "'Don't you weary, my friend,' said she, stooping so often. "'No, no,' said he smiling, and offering a handful of ripe fruit. I don't worry, he added. I'm just waiting. Waiting. I think I'm getting ripe now, and I must soon be dropping, and then the Lord will pick me up. Oh, said he, speaking earnestly to the lady, you are young yet, just in blossom. Turn well around to the sun of righteousness, that you may ripen well. Here was the long time of growing and of ripening, not long in one sense, but long in another, long enough to grow and grow, long enough to ripen and ripen. It is of a long time like this that the Lord speaks to us in this parable of the servants. The Italian poet, imprisoned cruelly in a dark cell, is represented as uttering these mournful words, Long years, long years, for so they seem to him in his solitude, and in a like sense we often use the words all day long, and all night long, and also the whole long year, and thus the word long has acquired a peculiar meaning, expressing not only the real amount of time, but the number of events that have been crowded into the space, as if the trials past had lengthened out the time. It is to this solemn sense of the expression, after a long time, that we now turn the reader's thoughts. We wish to make him feel the responsibility which is laid upon every man by the long time given to us by God to prepare for the coming eternity. God will not take one by surprise. He is too just and too pitiful to do so. He warns before he strikes. Nay, he gives a thousand warnings, even during the shortest life. Each day is made up of warnings. Too plain to be mistaken, too loud to be unheard. No one in the great day of reckoning shall be able to say, I was not told of what was coming. I was hurried off to the judgment seat without notice given or time allowed to make ready. A pilot that runs his vessel upon the rocks at noonday with his eyes open to see the cliffs and his ears open to hear the breakers is without excuse. At St. Ab's Head on the east coast of Scotland many a vessel in former years was shipwrecked when the strong east wind of the German Ocean drove it upon the treacherous lee shore. 
Some years ago, a lighthouse was built and a curious foghorn set up, which in mist, whether by day or night, makes its warning voice to be heard for miles around. No pilot now, who wrecks his vessel on these terrible rocks, can say, I got no warning that they were so near. For in the clear night, the beacon light shines out to tell him of danger, and in the thick gray mist, the foghorn sounds its hoarse note to say, Beware. Thus the light and the voice from heaven are perpetually warning the sons of men and saying, Prepare to meet thy God. The warnings of one day or one week, how many? The warnings of a year, how many more? The warnings of a lifetime, how innumerable? No man shall be able to say that he perished unwarned or that God took him by surprise. The foghorn, pealing through the haze, sounds dismally and seems like the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Flee from the wrath to come. Repent, repent, turn ye, turn ye, for why will ye die? And thus it is that God is each day calling aloud to us and pointing us from the rocks to the haven of safety in Jesus Christ our Lord, the one haven which no storm can reach. God gives us time enough to turn and live. When a teacher sets a task of a few pages to his scholar and says, I give you a week to do it in, he allows him a long time, for the task is one which might be done in an hour. So when God says, Seek ye me, and ye shall live, or acquaint thyself now with God, and be at peace, he gives us a lifetime for this. He is giving us a long time. We delay, and linger, and loiter, so that year after year passes by, and we are no nearer God than at first. But our delays do not change the long time. We make it a short one by our folly. But it was really long for the thing that was to be done, the single step that was to bring us to Christ and place us beneath the shadow of his cross. For that there was time enough, even in the shortest life, so that no one can say at last, I had no time given me to prepare for eternity, and I was hurried to the grave without time to seek the Lord. I gave her space to repent, Revelation 2.21, are the warning words addressed to the sinners of Thyatira, and he speaks the same words to us. Space to repent is the message still. Repent is the burden of the exhortation, and this he follows up with, I give you space to repent. This long time is a time of long suffering. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. James 5.11 He spares to the uttermost. He yearns over the sinner. He beseeches him with all the earnestness and sincerity of God to be reconciled to himself. He bears refusals, insults, and provocation, hatred, and scorn, and coldness, not smiting the rejecter of his love, nor taking vengeance on his enemies, he is not easily provoked, but beareth all things, endureth all things, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3.9 He renews each day his offer of pardon with a long suffering that seems to know no limit, and with a profound sincerity that is fitted to win the most obdurate and suspicious of the sons of men. Account that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation, for to nothing less than salvation does this long suffering point. Why will ye die? is the urgent question of God to the heedless sinner. Have I not given you time enough to seek and find eternal life? Am I not in earnest in beseeching you to be reconciled to myself? This long time is man's opportunity. Is pardon to be found? Now is the time. Is eternal life to be obtained? Now is the time. Is heaven to be won? Now is the time. Is the straight gate to be entered and the narrow way to be pursued? Now is the time. Is the immortal soul to be saved, a crown to be received, and a kingdom to be possessed? Is the chain to be broken, the prison to be fled from, the darkness to be exchanged for light, and the everlasting woe to be shunned? Now is the time. This is thy opportunity, O man. Seize it and use it ere it passes away forever. There is danger all around. Hell is laying its snares. The storm is gathering. But still there is time. All heaven is shining yonder, full in view. The door is as wide open as the love of God can throw it. The Son of God entreats you. Angels beckon you in. The earthly ambassadors beseech you. Now is your opportunity. Will you let it slip? Is it such a trifle to lose heaven, to lose your soul, to lose eternal gladness? Oh, man, delay not! This long time will end at last. The Master will return and call His servants to account for the way in which they have spent the time and used the gifts. The acceptable year of the Lord will end in the day of vengeance, and that vengeance will be real, for it is the vengeance of God. The long time allowed us here to prepare for the great reckoning will be nothing to the far longer time of the unending eternity, an eternity of ever-deepening darkness, 
forever brightening glory.